Good morning, everyone. So glad to see you all here in the Lord's house with the Lord's people on the day we remember his resurrection from the dead uh, this Easter Sunday. Um, we are going to be looking at the gospel and closing with uh, reading from, from the gospels about uh, <clears throat> that first Sunday, that Easter Sunday. Uh, just to, uh, by way of introduction, ours, ours is an, an evangelical church, and we get that word from the Greek evangelion. Uh, it's also a word translated uh, gospel and behind evangelist. Um, it's about proclaiming good news. It, it's about heralding a glad message. Uh, there are many Christian denominations, and uh, we would differ from them in a lot of issues of governance. Um, Baptists hold uh, to there being two offices and a congregational rule, whereas the Episcopal Church or the Church of England, Church of Ireland, uh, is run by bishops, or the Presbyterians are run by a group of elders. Uh, the question like, when do you baptize someone? Or does the Lord's table minister grace by the elements? Or what, what does spirit filling look like? Um, your answer to these important questions will likely line you up with, with some form of church already in operation. And uh, I've answered those questions, and I, I'm here today. I'm a Baptist, and that's uh, what I am. That's how I worship. But uh, <clears throat> one, one key uh, aspect what, within those various Protestant groups, the word evangelical references those who approach the gospel, how Christ died for our sins, the same way every person is born with sin and actively sins. This sin uh, earns punishment in hell. God created a path for forgiveness and reconciliation by sending his son to become a man, live a righteous life, and die as our substitute. By depending on his finished work, we can be forgiven and reconciled to God. You must depend on Christ alone to save you from your sin sin's penalty and to give you a relationship with God. So I'm going to read this passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which uh, you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I have preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also. Paul here declares the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins. And as we remember the resurrection and celebrate it, the importance of what happened that led up to it. The, the resurrection only means something when you understand the sacrifice that went into it. So Christ died for our sins. Um, so just discussing first the point that Paul raises, our sins. What are our sins? There's an <coughs> issue when, uh, when we consider ourselves, we look at ourselves as we rate ourselves one, one against the other and we look Say, so, you know, am I better than my neighbor? Am I doing, and we read about horrible things in the news, and we're, well, I'm better than that person. Maybe, maybe not vocalize it, but we sort of feel, how am I doing in, in relation to other people? I think I'm a fairly good person. Well, that's not the standard. The standard is how righteous are we? It's not, are we better than someone else? And God, God clarifies that for us, and he says, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's no one in and of themselves generating goodness perfectly, consistently, without fail. No one meets that standard. Uh, we're also told uh, that sin separates us from God, uh, both in Romans 3.23, where it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and also in Romans 5.12, where we read, therefore, just as sin entered into the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. We're all partakers of death because of our nature to sin. 
our, our tendency to sin, and then the sins that we commit earn us uh, those wages, those, those rightly earned, that rightly earned penalty. It's not, it's not false charges. It's, not, it's not, not that we've been framed. We rightly earn a separation from God, a, a death, and uh, Revelation tells us that death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. This punishment that we deserve is an eternal separation from God, for the wages of sin is death. Now, this is stark, this is the harsh news, but that's, that's where the good news comes into play, that it stands in contrast to our, our, our natural state, which has uh, our, our diagnosis of, of the hard thing, uh, position we're in, where when we stand on our own, we have sinned, we have earned judgment. God's law re- reflects his essence and character. Sin is breaking God's law. Uh, we've all, almost our society has has be, has lost the idea of what sin is and just embraced do whatever you want uh, ideals. But sin is breaking God's law. Any time we do something God prohibited or neglect His directive, we sin. The Ten Commandments uh, encompass false worship, blasphemy, dishonoring parents, murder, even murderous thoughts, adultery, or lust, lustful thoughts. Stealing, covetousness, and lying are all sins. And those ten overarching commands have many applications that we fail on a daily basis. But to simplify them, we are to love God as as Lord and to love our neighbor as ourself. Any action or intention that contradicts those two commands is a sin. Sin separates us from God and earns us his judgment, eternal punishment. Now, I, I think most of you, if, if you've not known me at all, you can at least tell a little bit from my accent. I spent a bit of time in America. I got to see several places. One place I didn't get to see was the Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon is immense, and apparently you just have to experience it. There are no words to describe. You just go to, it's not just a massive hole, although it is a massive hole. You go and you see this massive hole in the ground, and the climate changes, uh, you know, just as you climb down. It takes a whole day to to, to uh, navigate the trail so you can get down to the bottom. It's miles and it's just vastness of, of, of this, you know, it is a hole, but it, you know, it's just the, 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 the removal of, of all the dirt there just to, to leave that. And it's just impressive in its, its strength and its presence. Now, <clears throat> there are, you know, several, several daredevils who have done crazy things and the name that comes to mind is Evil Knievel, where you know you take a motorbike and try and jump over things, and he's, he's done incredible things and broken several limbs along the way. Um, and people follow in his his tracks, so to speak. Um, but if we were to to get uh, the best best motorcycles that are available, and you were to practice and practice and practice jumping as as far as you could, and you know I. It, you might have a better motorbike than I do, and we'll, we'll, we'll line up and we'll try and jump across the Grand Canyon. That would be absolutely ridiculous. No one would insure us. It's a fool's errand. We know. Now, you might say, but I made it farther than Matthew. My bike got me farther. I jumped higher. I went farther. Absolutely, you did. If it was just a race between who went farther, you would win. But neither of us would make it to the other side. And when it comes to the standard of God's glory, you might say, well, I'm a better person than Matthew. I I know what what, what sins he falls into. He's not a great guy. He's not as as polished as he looks like on a Sunday. I know know the real Matthew. I'm better than him. You probably are. You may very well be. But are you as good as God? And that's the standard. If we fall short of God's glory, if we don't measure up to who he is, if we're standing on our, on our own resources, we're coming to him saying, this is what I've earned. What you've earned on your own without Christ is death. It's death and hell. That's all you can ever have apart from God. No matter how much better than you are than me, no matter how much better you are than your neighbor, you before God, how do you stand? Do you fall short? And the Bible says we all do. We all fall short of that standard. Don't ignore God's perspective on your sin. Look at the law. 
that reveals who God is and respond to what you see. Don't soon forget the standard of true righteousness, how you really should be treating your, na- your, your neighbors, your spouse, your children, your co-workers. Your selfishness, your short-temperedness, your wounding words, complaining and grumbling spirit show your sinfulness. People with sin inside them need salvation from outside themselves. And that's why we needed Christ to die for us, for our sins. <clears throat> you must depend on Christ to save you because he has paid sin's penalty on your behalf. In all of eternity, God intended to save mankind from sin. In, in creation, he knew that we would fall and that he would need to provide a way for us to be saved. Adam and Eve fell, were kicked out of the garden, and immediately God covered them with clothes clothes from an animal, providing a sacrifice, a covering for them, anticipating the time when Christ would come and be the substitute. But throughout the, the history of the Old Testament, and you read about these animal sacrifices, the animal sacrifices, from our standpoint, seem a bit cruel. You know, why would you just sacrifice an animal that way now you know especially if you're a city person more so than a farming person you know you're a little bit more used to it if you've slaughtered a few chickens yourself but you know the idea of of an animal sacrifice seems cruel but all of the sacrifices in the old testament were pointing to the sacrifice that christ would make they were trusting that god would make provision that god would spill blood that would pay for our sins. They were putting their faith in that. And we can look back and see what Christ has done and put our faith in him. So no longer do we need a temple where we need to offer sacrifices like that because we can worship God in spirit and in truth. But God the Son became man. He became man because man needed to atone for man's sin. Someone had to die. Blood had to be shed. And that's why Christ, God the Son, took on him full humanity. So in Matthew 1.23 it says, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. It's not that Jesus was a man who became God. God the Son became man. He He added humanity to who he was so that he could live a life in obedience to the law. The son, God the Son lived a righteous life under the law. Now, this is a little longer passage. It says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you that until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a, of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called the greatest. Uh, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. That was why Jesus came to fulfill the law. Everything that we were responsible for before God. He kept. He, he did everything that he was supposed to do. If you re- recall when, when he went to John the Baptist uh, to be baptized, John the Baptist said, I, I have need to be baptized of you. I, I shouldn't baptize you. And, and Jesus said, it's necessary to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus w- w- even submitted himself to baptism by a man. You know, his cousin, not uh, part of his creation, John the Baptist was a fallen man himself. Jesus submitted himself to that to fulfill everything about the law, everything that we need to do. He did. He has full righteousness. And he died for our sins. First Peter 1, uh, 2, verse 24 says, uh, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Uh, As you go through the account of the crucifixion, there's a time when the world is plunged in darkness, and Jesus says, My Father, why have you forsaken me? 
It's at this moment that, it's through this time that the eternal being who is Jesus is being separated from the eternal being who is the Father. And God is judging, judging Jesus on our behalf. His wrath has been poured out on, that, on, on, on his son on our behalf. And the reason is God, God is just and he can't just overlook sin. He can't say it doesn't matter. It does matter. It, ha- it not it only matters, it has to be paid for. And so he sent Jesus as our payment, as our substitute. And the Father sent the Son to become a man and obey the law on our behalf. In his death on the cross, Jesus received the wrath of God against sin. It was not just the pain of the whipping and thorns or the slow suffocation that cruci- the crucifixion inflicts that was torturous. In that time of the cross, the Father treated the Son as the substitute for our punishment, pouring his wrath on Jesus and withdrawing his fellowship. The eternity in hell that we deserve, separated from God and enduring suffering, Jesus took on himself. And since he is an eternal being, he could do it in an afternoon. He could do it in a period of time because he is eternal. He took that for us. Otherwise, we'd have to do it ourselves for eternity. <clears throat> the idea of substitutes, as I said, goes back uh, throughout animal sacrifice in the, in the Old Testament, particularly uh, when Abraham, who finally received the child of the promise, Isaac, takes him to the mountaintop and is, is told to sacrifice his son. Now, Abraham, we learn in the New Testament, was convinced that this was the child of the promise, and even if God raised him from, would have to raise him from the dead, that's exactly what God would do. Abraham was convinced that even if he were to obey this command, Isaac would be the, the father of his, his grandchildren. Now, as he raised the knife, God said, stop. He sent an angel to say, stop. Now I know that you, you, you value me above, above your son. Look over there, there's a ram. And the ram stood in place of the son. It was substituted and, and took the place. And uh, <clears throat> just a, a, a little... little uh, window into the, the different dynamics between my, my wife and myself. As we, we sit down to watch a movie, the movies that, that make her cry are, are many, many movies. And she, you know, some of, the, some of them, the, the crying she enjoys and some of them she just doesn't enjoy. So we try to only do the, if she's gonna cry, it's for the, an enjoyment movie, you know, where someone finally falls in love after a while, a while of not, you know, or they're finally reunited. You know, those sort of movies are the ones that she's in, she, she will cry on. She doesn't like the ones where she cries because someone dies. You know, that's not, not why she wants to cry for a movie. Uh, now, um, my, the, the, my, my brother-in-law and his wife, I worked with them before I, I started dating my wife. So I you know, knew them from work, met, uh, met my wife, and we started dating. And, you know, so my sister-in-law, who worked with me, described me as having the emotional range of a teaspoon. <laughs> and that sticks in my mind, quite frankly, uh, as, as, you know, I get it, I get it. You don't know what's going on inside this face, and that's okay. Um, that's fine. Uh, but there are movies that make me cry, even still. And I know what it is. It's, it's the movie that someone has to sacrifice. Someone has to step up in the last moment and take the place of someone else and die. And that, that'll, that'll get to me. That, that gets to me. And I, you know, if I want to cry, that's, that's the movie to watch. Someone, someone who, it's usually a military setting, uh, but, but someone who'll stand up and say, no, it's okay, you go live, I'll do this. And, you know, they're fiction. But it reflects the reality of life, and this is... This is the reality that Christ stood in our place. He took our place so that we wouldn't have to suffer those things. Um, <clears throat> so just as you must accept uh, what uh, God views, how God views your sin, you must accept what God says about the solution. Jesus Christ offers himself as your substitute with the full payment of sin's penalty and the righteous fulfillment of God's expectations. You must accept God's substitution on your behalf. And uh, 
and a, you know, just a small sense of, I, I've never seen this in sports and I don't watch enough sports to have found it, but you know, I know that the idea of a substitution stands you know, where you have to, okay, we're substituting number 33 for number 10 and they switch. I don't know what would happen if the player says, no, no, I'm fine, you, no, you're, you, you, you stay on this. I don't think you're allowed to do that. I guess not. I, I don't see why, you, you, but you, know, you can only have so many people on the pitch, but you have to accept the substitution that Christ has made on your behalf. <clears throat> you must depend on Christ to save you because only his payment of sin's penalty is acceptable to God. Jesus is the only one who could atone for us. God made him to, who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There are people I'm very, very close to, like my wife and my family, some friends, that you know what, I might in that, that moment stand up and substitute for them, give my life for them. Be very hard to do that for a stranger, but I suppose, you know, under the, you know if with the right courage, I, I could. But I couldn't stand, I couldn't substitute for anyone else to pay the price for their sin, because I have my own sin to pay for. And you, no matter how much you love someone else, couldn't, couldn't substitute for anyone else to pay the price for their sin, because you have your own debt to pay. The only one who could pay the price for our sin, the only one who could be our substitute, is the one who had no sin. And that's who Jesus is. He's the one with no sin who could substitute for us. <clears throat> Jesus is the only one who can give you life instead of death. We mentioned earlier how the, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is the gift that he offers, that he can bring, and he alone. And there, there's a lot of, lot of discussion you know, trying to make religion equivalent with other religions. Christianity is side by side with, with Islam and Judaism called the three great faiths because of Abraham. And there's certainly a heritage there. A lot of teachings line up. But the distinction is how Christ claims to be exclusive. When he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There's no other way to have a relationship with the Father other than through Jesus. As much as you might appreciate other, other philosophies, other faiths, and as much as they might help you along your life and be a better person, they won't help you have a relationship with the Father because only Jesus can do that. <clears throat> and since uh, you must depend on Christ to save you uh, because only his payment of sin's penalty is acceptable to God, Jesus is the one you must depend on for salvation. Romans 10, 13, and 14 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then shall they call on one in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe uh, in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? We have this opportunity this morning if we work backwards through the verse. I'm preaching to you. I'm presenting to you, I'm telling you the good news. And you're hearing. We've got those first two things done. The question is next, have you believed? And have you called on the name of the Lord? That's what falls to you. If you understand your sin, your sin has earned you a place in hell, rightly before a just God who can't let any sin in his presence, a holy God. How could heaven be heaven if sin were there? Sin can't enter into heaven, can't enter into God's presence, but he has provided a way. He has provided a substitute in, on your behalf and in your stead, the perfect man, Jesus, who was always God, added humanity, died on the cross on your behalf. And if you trust in him, the payment that he made for your sin will be applied to you and that you will be given life in him forever. That is the opportunity. Understanding what the Bible says about our natural state and position before God is important. It's the first step. But beyond understanding uh, is agreement and uh, depending on that reality. 
Many people know the Christmas and Easter accounts, but they don't reflect anything of God's truth and life. The Epistle of of James um, particularly challenges us to the type of faith that results in action, saying, faith without works is dead. Now, climate change is quite a hot-button topic right now, and we're getting a lot of regulations, and I, 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 I don't know about you, but I'm not quite willing to give up my combustion engine in 2035, uh, but that's, that's on, the, on the cards upcoming. And in America, particularly, it's, 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 uh, it's a policy issue on one side or the other, whether or not you'll get votes. They're asked the question, do you believe in climate change? And if they answer yes, uh, that'll appeal to a certain type of voter. And if they answer no, that'll appeal to a different type of voter. Do you believe in climate change? I don't know about you, but for all the, all the politicians and the leaders who've been answering yes, they believe in climate change, they're taking an awful lot of private jet trips to resorts to, to, uh, to save the world from climate change. And that just doesn't strike me quite right. I don't know about, like, if, if, if you really are convinced, if you believe that your carbon footprint makes a difference on saving the planet, don't take a private jet. That's just my conclusion. I'm not commenting on on the science or anything. I just want consistency. And I think there's a lot of hypocrisy. And yet these people are saying, yes, I believe. Yes, I believe in climate change. Okay, stop taking private jets. Do you believe in Christ to save you from sin and hell? Do you trust him to reconcile you with the Father? A lot of people claim to be Christians but have never made that point of depending on Jesus alone. Now, they, they agree, they understand about the gospel story. They understand and they agree that Jesus died for their sins, but they've not come to the point of depending on him to do it for them. Um, there was in the 1850s particularly, but he had a career uh, throughout, my, uh, a trapeze artist, a, a, a tightrope walker named Charles Blondine, and uh, was his stage name, uh, and he, he did a, a bunch of incredible things. You know, it's all about a tightrope. He even performed in uh, Portobello Gardens, performed in London. But he, he, his 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 worldwide fame came from doing an act on Niagara Falls. Now he put a tightrope, an 1,100-foot tightrope, out across the Niagara Gorge, and uh, it's about 160 feet off, all above the water. And I don't know about you, I don't mind heights, but I'm not that crazy, okay? So this guy, he's going out on a tightrope. You go out with a, a beam, you know, balancing beam, and he comes back with a balance. That's cr- great, crazy, everyone goes wild. Well, you can't, you know, if you know everything about show business, you have to keep upping the ante. You can't just leave it where it is. So he, he had to keep adding things to his act. You can't just go out with a, a beam. And so eventually he was doing crazy things, like he went out with a wheelbarrow, Came back, oh, that's crazy. Oh, yeah, but, it, but that fades in a few days. Like, so he, he, went out, he went out with a chair, put the chair on two legs on the, on, the, on the rope and sat on the chair and balanced himself on the chair in the middle of the rope. And you can imagine that this rope is swaying like this. So this guy's incredible with his, his balance. He, uh, he took out a stove, cooked himself an omelet, ate the omelet, and then continued on his way. All these things are incredible feats. The story is told, one day he went out with the wheelbarrow, came back, and quite, uh, everyone's going crazy. Quiets down the crowd, he says, who believes I can put a man in this wheelbarrow and take him across? Crowd went crazy. I believe, I believe, yes, I believe. So he pointed to someone in the front row and he said, sir, could you please get in the wheelbarrow? And the man bolted, because he wasn't crazy. Because he believed intellectually Blondine can take a man in the wheelbarrow and go across, but he wasn't willing to trust that Blondine could take him in the wheelbarrow and take him across. And that's the difference. You can, you can absolutely be a Christian and agree with a lot of what the, you know, the community and be involved in the history, but unless you've trusted in Christ yourself, you haven't believed the gospel. You believed about the gospel, you've agreed with the gospel, but you've not depended on the gospel. And that's the the question before you this morning. As we remember how Christ raised from the dead, um, the 
My uh, self and my wife, this, this last three weeks, we, we, we've bought a new car because the, the car we had before uh, just became unreliable. Now, it would, it would stall, you know, just random times, stall. It's like something's in the engine or there's something, is, is the fuel not getting in, is the air not getting in, is the sparks not going right, and it's going to cost a lot to figure it out, a lot going on there. So our car became unreliable. So we had a backup car, borrowed from my parents, a car they're not using, and we'd, you know, because it's, it's unreliable. We're not putting our faith in the car that we've owned and that we've been able to trust because we don't, we don't, we didn't trust it anymore. We didn't trust it anymore. And that's fair enough. It's, you know, it's a car. It's not promised to live forever, you know, you know work for us forever. Um, but we, we, because we had the second car, you could say, oh, they don't have confidence in their car. They don't, if they have a backup, they don't have any confidence in that car. And if I were to, you now there are three, three empty chairs there in the first row. Um, if I were to bring up two of those chairs and I were to say, this chair, I, I am confident this one chair can hold me up. And as I sat down, I sat down on both chairs. You'd say, no, nah, I'm not so sure if you believe that that chair will hold you up. And you'd be right. Because if I was splitting my confidence between the two chairs, if I was putting my weight on, on both chairs, I'd be demonstrating, I don't have confidence that this one chair can hold me up alone. A lot of people who have been raised in Christianity and are familiar with, with what the Bible says, they're trying to do good things to earn God's favor in addition to believing about the gospel. You have to come to the point where you have put your confidence in Christ alone. A lot, the Christian life flows from that decision. You need to do good works afterwards, and your faith will, will, will support you in those good works afterwards. But the key decision, the point is, have you trusted in what Christ did alone? And that's your only hope. I can stand before you today and say, if Christ doesn't bring me to heaven because of what he did on the cross, I'm going to hell because I have nothing to offer. I've put my trust in it. Now, I've done good things, and I've, I've studied the Bible, and I've tried to help people, and I've tried to have good attitudes and, and supportive, and all those things because of who I, I, I have trusted and I want to follow. But if, if Christ doesn't save me, I have no hope. That is, is, but I have absolute confidence in who he is and what he has promised. And I hope for you today that as we read about the resurrection, that's the confidence you have as well, that you have trusted in Christ alone to save you and take you to him because he promises that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Put your faith in him alone. <clears throat> the resurrection is what we're celebrating today and the celebration of that miracle is the stamp, God's stamp of approval on the sacrifice that Christ made. And often we, we can lose, if, unless we invest ourselves in understanding what the gospel is, we can miss the value of the resurrection. The resurrection is not just that, like Lazarus, uh, Jesus came back to, be, to spend time with his friends. That's not the point. It's a different kind of resurrection. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Elijah, Elisha, had had, had, were raising people from the dead. Jesus raised Lazarus. The, this resurrection was different because it followed the, the God's pouring his wrath on his son. The, the sacrifice, the substitution Christ made. He died, he was buried, and he rose again, signifying that it was acceptable. God said, that is my only way of salvation for you. Trust in Christ. If you have the pew Bibles there, let's turn to Luke chapter 24. And I'm uh, just going to read the rest of the section. Uh, we, we heard earlier in the reading about the resurrection. Uh, so uh, starting in verse 13 in Luke 24, we read, Now that same day, Two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. 
As they talked they dis uh, and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He, a he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they re replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us what they had seen, uh, the, uh, that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, uh, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are, and, and how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them uh, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him uh, strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he, broke, uh, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked uh, each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven, and those uh, with him assembled together and saying, is it true the Lord has risen and appeared to, Sim uh, to Simon? And then the two told them what had happened on the way and Jesus, how Jesus was recognized by them, by them when he broke bread. While they were talking about, Je about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? Why do your doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they did, still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? But they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. This is what we celebrate. The acceptable victory of Christ on the cross, how it has, he has paid our, the price for our sins. We are, we are celebrating that resurrection. If you've not made that choice to trust in Christ, to rely on him alone, I'm sure you're a good person and respected by your friends, but are, have you trusted Christ in that way? If you have, I hope today is doing two things for you. One is causing your heart to rejoice at the salvation that you have. And two is just a model as to how you can, you can present the gospel to others, because that is the responsibility that falls to us now, to preach to all nations. Let's uh, close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your love, how you love the world and sent your son to die on our behalf. Lord, we thank you uh, that you want a relationship with us and that if we simply confess our sins and call out to you, depend on your, your promise that you will save us. Lord, we thank you. And we rejoice in you this day, Lord. Please bless us throughout this week, and may we go in the power of your spirit to declare your word. We trust you uh, for this in Jesus' name. Amen.